Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer. We're back here again with one of our best of trending in eds as we round out the summer of 2022. Be on the lookout for a few more of these best of episodes as we gear up for our seventh season of Trending in Education. Our 500th episode is on the horizon. That'll all pick up very shortly in September. Between now and Labor Day, we're going to bring you some more of our greatest hits. Today's episode is with Dr. Michelle Miller-Adams, who wrote The Path to Free College, where she breaks down the college affordability problem that we have in the U.S. Michelle talks a lot about the Kalamazoo promise and some of the efforts around promise schools that have bubbled up around the U.S. in recent years. Really interesting model. And I thought it was a stark counterpoint to the student loan relief, the debt forgiveness that President Biden is putting forward. I thought this was a really interesting counterpoint to that angle, where in many ways you're not addressing the root problem when you give that debt relief. Still probably makes sense to give the debt relief, and it does beg some questions around what sorts of loan practices were involved in giving folks these loans to begin with, what kinds of interest rates these folks have gotten on their loans to the point where they owe many times more than the principal in some cases. It's a good move from my perspective, but it's clearly not enough. A lot of what Michelle was talking about, and you can still track her on Twitter, we'll have all that information in the show notes, is more about a genuinely alternative model more in line with the history of free or affordable college and higher ed experiences, building on what CUNY did and what the University of California did back in the mid 20th century. Good history lesson, good perspective. And for me, it was helpful to understand that there's a bit of a movement out there to plug into. And hopefully the loan forgiveness doesn't ease the focus and the pressure on universities to solve their return on investment problem, the fundamental questioning that's happening now as tuitions continue to be too damn high and the return on that effort continues to be brought into question. It's a topic we're going to continue to revisit. Hopefully we'll continue to engage with folks like Michelle who are exploring ways to return the college experience to the American dream by making it more affordable and in many cases free. I was inspired by this conversation. I continue to be inspired by the work that Michelle and folks like her are doing. Definitely check out what they're doing if you want to stay informed on these issues. Her book, The Path to Free College, was a great read. We'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. And with that, we'll pick up with my conversation with Dr. Michelle Miller Adams, The Path to Free College, The Best of Trending in Education. Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined today by Dr. Michelle Miller Adams, who is a senior researcher at the W.E. Upjohn Institute for Employment Research and a professor of political science at Grand Valley State University. Michelle's written a really interesting book about a very zeitgeisty topic, The Path to Free College in Pursuit of Access, Equity, and Prosperity. Really interesting and timely stuff that we're going to dive into. But before we get to any of that, Michelle, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, and you you wrote a really interesting book, which I just got through, and it did speak to me in a few different ways. It was also beautifully researched, very accessible. I had only understood the free college conversation in a abstract, notional way. And the book, I would recommend it highly to our listeners, folks who are interested in understanding how to get their arms around, what do we mean by free college? What's the history of it? And then what are the opportunities we have moving forward and some of the challenges? We're going to get into all of that. But before we do that, I always love to begin uh, by getting our guests origin story, which is something that you weave nicely into the book. Can you begin by letting our listeners know how you got to this point in your professional life? Absolutely. Yes. And and thank you, because that's what this book was really um, trying to do, was step back and take this high-level look at this 
complex and and, an often misunderstood topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I grew up in California in the 1970s, and I grew up in a place and at a time when higher education was really affordable. My brother and I, from solidly middle-class families, went to the University of California. We paid, by comparison today, a trivial amount in, in tuition. And uh, I really took that for granted. And it was only later on, in fact, when I started to work on this book, that I, I came to realize how pivotal this system of free higher ed had been in my own family's history. Mm -hmm. My parents grew up very poor, yet they were able to go to the University of California essentially for free mm -hmm. in the 1950s. And it was a, a very important turning point for our family's socioeconomic status. It flipped the switch, moving them from a track of being in these very poor immigrant families into the middle class where I grew up. And the importance of that has become even more clear to me as a professor, where I see students, many of them first-generation college goers, just struggling to afford college, working so many jobs. And it, it's really underscored to me that free college is a good, not just for its own sake, but a, a societal good that can really change um, the prospects of families and individuals. Mm -hmm. By another luck of timing, I lived, grew up in California, lived in New York for grad school, eventually moved to Michigan and was living in Kalamazoo, where I've lived for upwards of 20 years, where for those of you who aren't familiar with Michigan geography, we're exactly halfway between Detroit and Chicago, yeah. a small city in West Michigan. We're on the interstate that runs between Detroit and Chicago. And I was living here at a time when the city was really struggling with losing corporate headquarters, losing some of its more educated citizens, the, the urban core was becoming increasingly poor. The urban school district was the place that served most of the community's non-middle class, non-whites. And in 2005, a group of anonymous donors in our community announced this program that would send graduates of our local public school district to college for free. It's a uniquely generous program. It's called the Kalamazoo Promise. And I started studying it and I affiliated with the Upjohn Institute. And for about 15 and a half years now, I've been following not just what's happened in Kalamazoo, but what's happened around the country as different communities have replicated the Kalamazoo promise. And I've been very much in the weeds around this movement. We've worked with communities designing their own programs. We've done evaluations. We've consulted with stakeholders. And the time seemed right to really step back and take a much broader look at how this whole free college conversation came about and has grown so intense to the point where it, it is really on everybody's lips these days. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting how central in the narrative, at least, you, you were positioning Kalamazoo because Kalamazoo also was part of a, a similar discussion about open access, public access to universal high school, really. Can you clarify a little bit about that history? Yes, I, I love history and I love to write about it. And I was a history major as an undergrad, in fact. So there's a little bit of history in this book. Kalamazoo, I think it's really a coincidence, but it's an interesting coincidence that Kalamazoo played an important role in what's called the high school movement which was the period from the late 1800s to the early 1900s when high school became universal and free. We often take for granted that our, our systems have been the way they are forever, but the, the idea that everyone should and could go to high school and wouldn't have to pay for it is a relatively new idea. And it was a controversial idea. And when you go back and read the history about it, some of the debates are strikingly similar to the debates we have today over adding some free universal years of higher education yep. to that K through 12 chunk. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a very important lawsuit in Kalamazoo in the 1870s where some wealthy property owners sued the school district, which had started to use property taxes to make the local high school free. Mm. And the, the, the property owners lost their case. The case was called the Kalamazoo School Case. It was uh, decided by the Michigan Supreme Court and it became a very important piece of case law that it was legitimate for communities to decide to 
create universal high schools paid for by property taxes. Mm -hmm. And it gave a boost to that universal high school movement. Yeah. So the debate is somewhat similar today. The other historical cases I look back to in the book are the system in place in California until the 1970s, where uh, for the first 100 years of California's higher ed system, it was tuition free. Mm -hmm. And that changed. Uh, it changed in large part because of the unwillingness of property owners to uh, continue to pay high property taxes. So in yeah. California in the 70s, we had this thing called the taxpayers revolt, or sometimes it, it's known as Proposition 13. And that really set the higher ed system in California on the trajectory it is everywhere else of yeah. charge more and more tuition. I also look a little bit at the history of the City College of New York mm -hmm. system, which is different, but was also tuition free for its first 100 years. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting to understand that these ideas, while they seem very all current, even though you're talking about a 15 year span, 16 years now since the Kalamazoo uh, initiative, these ideas have been part of our educational debate in the United States really since our founding in a lot of ways. It, is education a public good? Who pays for it? Who has access to it? And then if it is a public good, how do we know that it's actually delivering on those things? Your book, even though it's quite readable, is pretty ambitious in that it's trying to get its arms around, even using your words, is a movement where it's less of a top-down, this is what the federal government is saying, therefore this is what everyone's going to be doing. It's more there's this broader awareness of some of these underlying problems. And then the ideas like what started in Kalamazoo, they diffuse across our culture in a very interesting way. It reminded me a lot of the, the stuff I've read about social movements and grassroots movements. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that because that was somewhat informative to me. Yes, I want to jump back for a moment to what you said a few minutes ago that often um, free college is presented as this radical, even sometimes socialist idea, when the idea that higher education is affordable is actually something that was integral to the U.S. higher ed system. The big difference is now many more people want to go on to higher ed. So it was affordable, it was often free, but it wasn't used by the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is something that is of interest to many people today. And it's hard to sustain that free system under those conditions. Yeah. But it's not at all a radical idea. What we're talking about is really a return to those same engines of opportunity that were available at earlier times. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, diffusion is a great word. And, and this is often how innovative policies start in the U.S. There's actually a whole political science literature around policy diffusion. And often uh, a good idea starts at the local level in local communities, and then it spreads across communities. People write about like the fluoridation of water and, and other innovations like that, they, that spread that way. Sometimes they start at the states, which are sometimes called laboratories of democracy. A, a policy idea, in this case, the idea of making college tuition free for a large group of students within a community spread from community to community and then to states and then from state to state. And at the same time, there was this national conversation going on, mainly around the price of college. Mm -hmm. And that has been intensifying, I'd say, over the past seven years, seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. And those two movements, that grassroots bottom-up movement and that top, that high-level national discussion really came together. One of the really interesting challenges is when you have a policy that diffuses that way is that it gets tweaked for individual communities. So the free college idea looks different in different places. And sometimes that's because communities have different needs. Sometimes it's because they have different resources. So maybe they can make a more limited promise to their students than another community might be able to. So it's a challenging and interesting field to study because it's extremely heterogeneous and mm -hmm. really every program is different, sometimes in a very small way, sometimes in a big way. And it, it's hard to even identify and be clear on the field, what the field is, who's in it and who's out. So yeah. it's not a top down. There's no one in charge of this free college movement. It's something that has bubbled up. Yeah, and it all generally is under the, the the promise label, right? We did do a show a while back about LeBron James's I, I Promise uh, Academy in Akron, 
which is another example of this where it's really been community-based, bottom-up in one frame. And then I think in another frame, there is also institutional and state-based frames of reference. I did find that the general frameworks you put together were accessible in a way that I now feel much more comfortable wading into some of these conversations. So the two aspects of the frameworks that I found helpful, one was the the difference between the the, the community-based, institutional-based, and state-based programs on the one hand. And then on the other hand, it's to provide affordability, equity, and employment. So can you just broad brush, put the high-level framework together for us? Sure, absolutely. And yes, no one owns that term promise. So any organization can call itself promise this, promise that, and they do. But sometimes we will use that term promise interchangeably with the idea of a, a local or a statewide free college program. And in fact, President Obama used it when he proposed a free community college program. He called that America's college promise. Hmm. But you'll find promise used in a lot of different contexts. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that my colleagues and I have done at the Institute is we've tried to develop a definition of what you can include in a coherent group so you can actually study it and make some general comments about it. And so we've looked at a, a whole group of local and um, statewide free college programs. And with colleagues in other communities, we've come up with this three-part categorization. Some of these programs emanate from local communities. Kalamazoo Promise is a good example. The Pittsburgh Promise is an example. There are roughly over a hundred of those mm -hmm. around the country. There is another group of free college programs that come from higher ed institutions themselves, community colleges. Mm -hmm. We don't include in this definition programs that are offered by private colleges or by four-year flagships that make college tuition free for people below a certain income level mm -hmm. or local students. We are talking about programs that really try to make themselves accessible in a universal way. And there's about another hundred community colleges around the country, many of them in California, that have said, we are no longer charging tuition. So mm -hmm. you can come here tuition free. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third group of uh, programs that come from states. And they're about, it depends how you, exactly how you'd find them. They're roughly 15 to 20 states that have adopted this model. The best known is the Tennessee Promise, mm -hmm. and it was um, the first, but there are another dozen plus states that have emulated that program, including New York. Once again, they all look different yeah. <laughs> in their details. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, the overview of the field, and you can map programs into one of those three categories. The yeah. I Promise program you mentioned, LeBron James program, is a community-based mm -hmm. uh, promise program. In writing the book, one of the big things that motivated me to write the book was this in the weeds close observation of the promise movement, watching communities and institutions and states say, hey, this is a good idea, we should do this here. And at the same time, recognizing that they weren't always clear on why they were doing it. So what I tried to do in the book is articulate these different rationales for why free college is helpful. Mm -hmm. One of those is I call access, but it really has to do with the price of college. And everyone knows how expensive tuition has gotten. Yeah. There's a lot of concern. And I would say that's really driving the national conversation around free college. Mm -hmm. Who gets to go? What kind of institutions do they get to go to? Why is college so darn expensive? What can we do to address that? Mm -hmm. The second issue, and this is often implicit in these programs rather than explicit, is an equity argument around racial and economic groups that have not had the same level of access or level of success when it comes to higher ed. Mm -hmm. but there are real concerns. There have been great gains made by lower income students and students of color in accessing higher ed, but there are still very strong divergences in the types of institutions they attend and whether or not they complete degrees. Mm -hmm. And I steer clear for the most part in this book of the debate around student loan debt, which is a huge problem 
And obviously it's related to the price of college. It's related to these equity issues Mm -hmm. and it it needs to be resolved. But if you just resolve student loan debt and you don't resolve the price of college, you're just going to have more student loan debt. And also the the role of the federal government in particular with Pell Grants is, is another component that is mapped out very clearly through the book. It's local, state, and federal. And then the role that the federal government has played over the years is an interesting theme that that you weave uh, throughout. Absolutely. And most of these college promise programs rely on Pell Grants to help cover the cost of what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. That has some equity implications that, you know, we don't need to dive into at the moment mm-hmm. um, because I want to just mention the third rationale, which has been very important at the state level. And that has to do with, in the subtitle of the book, I call it prosperity, but it really has to do with employment. Mm -hmm. The fact that workers need some kind of degree or credential these days in order to get a good paying job. It doesn't need to be a bachelor's degree. Maybe it needs to be a short-term certification or credential or an associate degree, but it's really hard to get a good paying job with a high school diploma these days. Mm -hmm. And employers need more skilled workers. So there's a rationale that extends both to the workers and to businesses that says investing a a state or the, the national government investing in free college isn't just going to be good for the people getting free college. It's going to be good for the economy. Mm -hmm. And that has been a very important rationale. That's why you see things like very robust free college programs in very red states. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are not places where you would normally expect to find a, a, quote, progressive social policy. It's very much driven by the business community, uh, by the needs of the labor market. Yeah. And even Tennessee, to your point, was really a Republican governor, traditionally a red state, which is one of the real exemplars of of this whole movement. Exactly. Thank you for laying that out. That was very, very beneficial. I, I also thought it was interesting to hit on a few other ideas in here. One that I found really striking was that there's a misperception of the cost of college that winds up being really damaging for uh, many of the, the, the underserved populations that you're, you're talking about. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes. And, and the misperception runs the gamut from... People thinking college is like K through 12 and you get to go and and not understanding the extra costs. So, for example, if you arrive at community college, even if it's free community college, you might then go have to spend hundreds of dollars on books, which is not something that you necessarily know if you don't have people in your life who've gone to college. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you survey people who have limited college experience or, or college knowledge, as we call it sometimes, and you ask them what, how much it costs to go to college, you'll get answers that go hundreds of thousands of dollars. In other words, unattainable. Yep. So there's a lot of confusion around the price of college. It doesn't help that private colleges, which are the most expensive part of the sector, dramatically discount their tuition for yeah. a large portion of their students. Mm-hmm. I think the latest rate is is something like 53% of students attending private independent colleges yeah. don't pay the sticker price and right. yet the sticker price is what's advertised. Mm-hmm. So that puts a lot of students off from ever even contemplating or applying to one of those colleges. The whole process is a disaster. It's complicated. Yeah. It's opaque. It has a lot of steps involved that you may or may not know how to do. It's, yeah. it's not intuitive. It's not automatic. Mm-hmm. When you think about public education, K through 12 education, you move into an area, you, you show up at a school building or the school district, you say, here's my kid. They say, okay, your kid's in this grade. Show up at this state at this place. And college is very different from that. There are a lot of steps and a lot of hoops and a lot of hurdles. Mm-hmm. That are very hard to navigate if you don't have someone in your life who is familiar with them. Yeah, especially first generation students, which is something that you talk about in many different dimensions. There's even some great case studies of students peppered throughout the book, one of whom really just didn't know what other opportunities were out there. And then also frequently the burdens wind up keeping first generation students, low income students closer to home because they're actually economic drivers for their families, or they're really, you know, helping older and younger 
members of their family uh, navigate the complexity of living in our society. There was some interesting reference to creating more college-bound culture in, yeah. in high schools and, and elsewhere. Uh, can you expand on that? Absolutely. That's one of the most important functions of a place-based uh, promise scholarship, a place-based free college program. It uh, places the onus, not that the schools need more to do, but it places the onus on the schools to serve that navigation function by saying to a community and to a school district, okay, this is what happened in Kalamazoo. We're going to pay for students to go to college tuition free. What are you going to do to help them get there? Mm -hmm. So the school district had to start doing things like expanding who gets enrolled into advanced placement classes. These are some Kalamazoo examples, taking every sixth grader up to our local university for the day. There are kids who live in this town within a mile of the university who've never been there. They don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. They've never seen it. So going up there, spending the day, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a program in partnership with the library that now gives every kid in the school district a library card. And back in pre-pandemic days would also send them on field trips to go borrow books and return books. So yeah, yeah. literacy initiatives like that. A college readiness course offered in the high school, community-based FAFSA prep to give yes. support. Some churches after church services on Sunday would have volunteers come in and sit with parents and help them fill out that application for student financial aid. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of initiatives like that that don't require a free college program to happen, but they happen to be catalyzed or sparked by the existence of a free college program. Yeah, and that place-based model that you're describing, it's typically at a school district or at, even at an individual school level that everyone, regardless of their economic status, everyone gets access. And that's caused a little bit of uh, pushback and response around why are these more affluent kids getting that sort of free ride? Can you respond a bit to that? Yes, and that's a really challenging aspect, but I think an important part of this new place-based model. Not all of these programs are universal. And when I say universal, I mean that they're available to students regardless of their financial need and regardless of their academic merit. Those are the two main ways that scholarships are targeted in our society. So Pell Grants, lots of other scholarships are available to students whose family incomes are below a certain level. Other students earn scholarships because they have good grades or they're good musicians or they're good athletes or have a special talent in some other way. The difference in this place-based model is that it says you get a scholarship by virtue of being in this place, usually for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that students who may not have the financial need for the scholarship and also students who may not be very strong high school students may be entitled to a college scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. And there's a lot of evidence that is good. Mm -hmm. Good in terms of sending more students on to post-secondary education and training. Good to creating that sense of buy-in from the broader community that you've just referenced. First of all, no one is paying that incredibly high sticker price for private colleges. This is a movement that is largely focused on uh, community colleges, and some programs include four-year public institutions. Mm -hmm. And most of these programs exist in high-poverty communities. So if you go into a place like Kalamazoo and you say everybody gets a scholarship, provided they've lived here for at least four years, mm -hmm. you're going to scoop up some middle-class students. But this is a school district that has 70% uh, economically disadvantaged students. You're mainly serving students who are low income or moderate income. Yeah. And what I have found in my years of watching the Kalamazoo Promise is that even for those more middle income and upper middle income students who receive it, college is so expensive these days that it's hard for those families too yes. to afford college. So we have students now who are able to go away to college and not live at home because they now have this additional support or they're able to major in what they're really interested in instead of where they think they're going to get the best paying job because they're less worried about student loan debt. So there are benefits that extend the whole way. When it comes to statewide programs and the national proposal that the president has offered, 
the focus is overwhelmingly on community college. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for that, including good reasons. But in general, community colleges are not attended by affluent students. So that argument about why are we paying for rich kids to go to college doesn't hold a lot of water when you come to these larger scale programs. Yeah. And it's interesting, and you touch on it in the book, in light of the Operation Varsity Blues scandal, there is this perception that it's a rigged system and some of those myths, some of it's true, but also like why focus on that particular part of the story when the problem is more opening up access to community college. The community college piece is really interesting as well in that it's in many cases focused on reskilling, upskilling, becoming job ready within these communities that need revitalization. I think you talked about the El Dorado Uh, promise uh, as an example. I don't know if that's the right one to touch on, but can you expand a little bit on on the way in which uh, the private sector can get involved and how it can lead to some revitalization of these communities? Yes. The first thing your listeners need to know is that even though it sounds strange, in El Dorado, they actually pronounce it El Dorado. It took me a long time to get used to that. The El Dorado Uh promise, that's a town in Southern Arkansas, and their free college program was paid for by the city's largest employer. And that's something that happens in a number of communities. The Richmond, California Promise has large founding grant from Chevron. In Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Promise got a large founding challenge grant from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Mm -hmm. So why are businesses interested in the free college program? It's because they need educated workers. Mm -hmm. And community colleges, I, I think community colleges are, are a great choice for focusing promised programs. There is one downside, which is that not everyone should go to community college. Students who can get into more selective, competitive admission four-year institutions should be going to those institutions. And there is a phenomenon among high achieving, low income students that they often will, as you said, stay closer to home. Mm -hmm. And that phenomenon is called undermatching. They'll go to a school that is not as competitive as one that they could get into for a variety of reasons. One downside of limiting your scholarship to community colleges is that it can promote that undermatching. The choice of community college sector is, is is an important one because community colleges offer a lot of options to students. So you can go to a community college and get a very short-term credential or certificate in a skilled trade. Uh, A lot of what community colleges do is essentially vocational training, career and technical education. You can also go and get an associate degree and you can transfer onto a four-year institution and cut your overall tuition bill down substantially. Yeah. And community colleges play important roles in the local economy. They're often involved in economic development activities. They will do tailored training for local businesses that need workers trained in specific areas. Mm-hmm. And they serve, I'm sure many of your listeners know this, our picture of a college student is not what you find when you go to community college. You find older students with children, students with jobs, students who are retraining for new professions. Yeah. And as the work of a, a colleague and friend of mine has shown over the years, this is the Hope Center for College Community and Justice at Temple, run by Sarah Goldrick Rev. There are a lot of students, particularly at community colleges, who are struggling with food insecurity, who may be struggling with housing insecurity. So it's very different from our our popular image of who's sitting in a college classroom. Yeah. Uh, And those are all reasons why focusing free college on community college makes a lot of sense. In a perfect world where resources were unlimited, Mm -hmm. it would be wonderful to also be able to offer a tuition-free path to four-year public institutions. Yeah. But that's only happening in in a few places. Yeah. And then the history that shows that this has been something that has been tried successfully at different points in the U.S. over the years and that it's now happening when New York State has something like this going on. There are other states that are doing these types of programs that are in many cases benefiting the middle class as much or even more, which is sometimes a knock uh, on, on some of these programs. It's good to understand that there are some success stories to learn from, even as there are potentially some cautionary tales out there. As we're getting a little further into the conversation, any perspective there? What's the state of play today 
And then maybe we can start getting into any perspective you might have around what's on the horizon and how folks can get activated. Sure. I always debate whether or not to wander into this particular weed patch, but I think it's important to make the point that the design of these programs matters. And that, that's really a theme of the book, that as a community or as a state or as a national government, you need to figure out what it is you're trying to achieve and then design a program that helps get you there. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns about a lot of the free college programs today is that they are what in the scholarship business we call last dollar programs. And all that means is that the scholarship kicks in after you've already used your Pell Grants. So if you're a low-income student and you're eligible for federal financial aid, you can get up to close to $7,000 a year now toward your college costs. And many free college programs, especially at the state level, are structured so that you use your Pell Grants first, and then the scholarship program pays for the rest of your tuition. And that, of course, makes it affordable for states to launch and run these programs. The problem is it leaves students, especially low-income students, without sufficient resources to pay for their living expenses, which are usually much higher than the tuition costs of community college. Mm -hmm. So a different way to do that is to offer the scholarship on what's called a first dollar basis and let students hold on to their Pell Grants and use them for living expenses. Mm -hmm. There are a handful of local and statewide Promise programs that operate that way. Kalamazoo is one of them. Mm -hmm. But what President Biden has proposed, this tuition free community college plan that he offered in his American Families plan uh, presented at the end of April, is actually structured that way. The tuition free community college comes first. And if you are low income, you still have your Pell Grants. And that is a very productive and equitable more expensive, but better way to structure a free college program. Yeah. So design matters. It seems like geeky and, and, and policy wonkish, but your design choices are going to determine who benefits. Yeah. So really important. Yeah. And then you also talk about the, the spillover benefits as another way to understand this too, where some of these things may cost more, but ultimately if you're producing more employable graduates, who uh, aren't debt burdened, aren't dropping out and really becoming that sad story of no college degree and student debt, which is the the absolute worst case scenario. Can you give us a little bit of hope? Hugely important. And I think it's important when you think about free college that you don't think of it as just an expense. It's not just an expense. It buys you something, right? Mm -hmm. It's an investment. It's an investment in helping students be able to complete degrees and credentials, get better jobs, earn more money, pay more taxes, not be a burden on the social welfare system, not be in those straits of college debt. And as you said, often students will go off to college, and this is a particular problem with the for-profit sector, higher ed for-profit colleges, which are generally are really good at getting you to enroll and taking your financial aid and really bad at giving you usable, valuable degrees. Fortunately, most free college programs do not include that sector. So yes, the worst combination is you incur debt, but you still can't afford to to go to college. So you leave without getting a degree or credential. Mm -hmm. And it's the worst combination. It turns out that there's virtually no value in the labor market for having some college. That credential certificate degree that helps you get a better job. The spillover effects are huge. The lifetime earnings from getting an associate degree and then getting a bachelor's degree and even getting higher degrees than that are among the best investments you can make. And states, localities that have higher percentages of college-educated workers are economically more dynamic, successful, wealthier, and it benefits everyone in that community, not just the people with the college degrees. Mm-hmm. So that's what we mean when we talk about spillover effects. I, I like to think of these programs as having this dual value. They're a value to the individuals who are going to college and getting degrees, but they also have a public or a collective value. Mm-hmm. And if you think about a place like Kalamazoo, the Kalamazoo Promise donors were trying to help students go to college 
But what they're really trying to do is make Kalamazoo a more vital community, a place that's easier to come to and harder to leave, that yeah. businesses want to locate in, that people want to come to and stay in. Yeah. So that public, that collective benefit is a really important part of the rationale for these place-based scholarship programs. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. There's a real movement around community-based education in K-12. And a lot of this seems like a natural extension of community-based education. If folks are intrigued by this stuff, if they, they want to get activated, do you have any recommendations? It sounds like there's a lot of networking and connecting that is happening among the different components of these movements. Yes. One of the things that's really bolstered the free college movement is the emergence of several national advocacy organizations. And they will be happy to sign you up as members, take your money, engage dialogue. They're wonderful organizations. One is a very large umbrella organization called College Promise. It's just collegepromise.org. And it's a clearinghouse umbrella advocacy for all kinds of programs that make college more affordable and more accessible. Mm -hmm. Another one, which you can find at the website freecollegenow.org is the, called the Campaign for Free College Tuition. And that focuses more on states. It's another advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. And there's a third organization that is largely made up of student voices called RISE. Mm -hmm. And it's provided a really important advocacy voice by and for students. So those are all great places to start. I think it's also uh, worth noting that there is legislation in Congress and there will soon be a very robust discussion around whether the president's proposal for two years of tuition-free community college is going to become law or not. Mm -hmm. So all the usual engagement strategies apply there. Call your congressperson, write letters, check in on the legislation. If you are in a community and you're interested in replicating this kind of idea in your local community, we do convene periodically, almost annually. We met in Berkeley, California in 2019. We fortunately took 2020 off like everyone else. Yeah. But we're going to be convening in November 2021 in Kalamazoo for this meeting called PromiseNet. And it's more kind of a learning and networking conference. It's a great place to start if you're interested in thinking about whether this model makes sense for your community. So those are all places to go. We have a lot of data and information up on the Upjohn Institute website as well, which awesome. is john.org. Yeah, and we'll include as much of that as we can in the show notes for this episode. Before we let you go, I always love to ask my guests, what else in the world around you is capturing your imagination these days? Are there any trends, anything new emerging for us to keep our eyes on? I've been struck by the sea change in the rhetoric at the national level. For the first time since around 1980, I'm not hearing that government is the problem. I'm hearing that government might be the solution mm. or part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very dramatic change after four decades of essentially the, the neoliberal idea that, that markets are going to solve it all. And it's popular. That neoliberal idea, that trickle down idea that the, the private actors just give them a lot of freedom and a lot of tax cuts and everything will work out. It hasn't panned out. And we're living at a time of quite intense inequality that the pandemic really made worse and made more visible. Mm -hmm. So I think the combination of new leadership, the pandemic spotlight on inequality, I'm very hopeful that we might be able to turn to the national government and state and local governments, not as our enemy, but as her partner in making the world better and making people's lives better. Yeah. So I would stay tuned for that. I think there are still, we've been inculcated with the idea that you can never raise corporate tax rates. You can only lower them. I, I don't know if as a society, if we can raise them, but we can rethink the systems that we've created and create yeah. new ones or yeah. go back to the old ones we used to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting. Even the anti-tax movement in California, in many ways, gave rise to Ronald Reagan as a political figure who really began 
government as a problem, as a very successful political uh, stance for, for, for many years. So that's an interesting perspective. That's very true. And, and we've been living in that world for a long time. So I, I will say that this idea of free college, as well as the idea of universal pre-K, mm -hmm. very popular ideas across political identification. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have seen these free college programs take hold in communities of every kind, of every political complexion and states that range from Hawaii and, and Washington to Michigan and, and Tennessee and New York State, I, I think really attests to the appeal of the idea. It's the rare issue that can enjoy bipartisan support. So mm -hmm. it's always encouraging to be immersed in that practical solutions that really help people help the economy and are drawing support rather than the kind of polarization we normally see. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Ending with a ray of hope, which is always nice. Dr. Michelle Miller-Adams, the book again is called The Path to Free College in Pursuit of Access, Equity, and Prosperity. Very timely, worth checking out, and we'll be sharing all this information. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed it as well. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend, subscribe, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.